in this final lecture on observation, I would like to share some reflections with you on whether an observation is just an observation or also an interpretation. I would like to share, let's say, three thoughts about this. First, the question is, is an observation a recording of a situation or is it more? And uh, we saw with uh, the lecture on Franz de Waal um, that a trained eye can see more. His students that stayed there for a longer period of time could see more than students that just came in. And we also saw this uh, thing that I call the gestalt perception. And that is that you have to understand the rules of cricket in order to understand the game and the excitement of the game. So there is interpretation besides just observation. You need some interpretation as well. But there's also a backside, a flip side of it. And that flip side is this one about the hidden gorilla. There's a gorilla there. If you focus for something, if you focus on something, if you are too keen on a certain interpretation, then probably you miss a gorilla. Or um, in the words of Lippmann, for the most part, uh, we do not first see and then define. We define first and then we see. So it is neither a, um, a total observation nor it is a mere interpretation. But we need to interpret. We do need to interpret. And I have a short example from Gilbert Rao. He wrote an essay about this, about a twitch. Or was it a wink? Or was it a parody of a wink. And uh, Geertz also used this example in his famous essay on thick description. And the idea is that you can describe something thinly, so this as a contraction of the eye, um, but is it enough? No, it's not enough. We need more because we do a lot more in different situations when we contract the eye. For instance, you see here the twitch, you see a wink, and here you see the parody of a wink. And let's unravel this a little bit. So if we make a, a distinction between the twitch and the wink, a, a wink is deliberate. A wink is focused on someone in particular. And why? Because you want to invoke or impart a particular message. And the other one has to understand what you mean with this winking. So he or she needs to, to understand the code. And the others should not notice this, because otherwise you could have said it, a wink is very private. So it's conveying a code in privacy. So that's the difference between a twitch and a wink. But what's the difference then between a wink and a fake wink? A fake wink or a parody of a wink is more or less the same. Again, you contract your eye, but that's it, or not. Well, if we take a thicker description, we see that a fake wink is someone trying to look like the winker who's trying to impart a particular message according to an understood rule to, without the others noticing. But in this case, it is in order to amuse others. So this is the difference between a thin description and a thick description. A thin description, just the contraction of the, of the eye, and a thick description with all the other aspects in it. And we need interpretation for that. So why would, would we do this? Well, in order to convey meaning using both in-depth and contextual description. And Clifford Geertz famously uses this in order to describe Balinese society by describing a cockfight. So what he does is using very particular situation, but he can inflate that to broader society. You can also see this thick description going on in Lynn Loughlin's work on privatizing public space. We saw the very detailed description. Um, and these detailed descriptions, these thick descriptions, are really important for Loveland. But she uses these descriptions in order to create styles as well as rules. But it's not about the styles and rules in her work. It is, in the end, about what people do with it. So these 
detailed descriptions help in order to create the styles, rules, the typologies, but in the end, they help perfectly to understand what is going on in public space, how we try to privatize this. But the question still might be, what can we interpret? What can we interpret when we observe? And one of the answers that could possibly be given is the answer given by Harvey Sachs, and that is use common sense. What does Harvey Sachs say? Well, he says, if a member sees a category-bound activity being done, then if one can see it being done by a member of a category to which that activity is bound, then see it that way. Now, that seems a little bit abracadabra, but what he means is that if you see a certain type of behavior being done by a, by a member of a category that uses this behavior more commonly, then see it that way. And still abracadabra, but therefore, I gave a short example. Andrew Carlin realized that someone was a pickpocket. When he was on a conference in Brussels, he was uh, walking and he was walking behind three British men, three friends, and he was walking behind them and listening in to the fo football. He was eavesdropping about the football scores. And it seems that there were three friends, but at the, at the crossing, one of the friends left without saying anything. That was weird, Carling thought. Because why is that weird? Well, it's common if you walk with two friends and you part, then you say goodbye or something. So he didn't say a word. And Carlin didn't give it a, a second thought until he saw that same man again with a group of students. He didn't give the thought until he saw that same man again with a group of tourists. And now that was weird. Because this man didn't look Asian, the tourists were Asian, as it seemed. These tourists were watching the buildings, but this man, although he was standing really close to the tourists, he wasn't looking at the building. He was looking at their purses, at their bags, at their pockets, probably. And then Colin all of a sudden realized, this man has to be a pickpocket. But how can I conclude this? I'm a sociologist. I'm not allowed uh, to have such stereotypes. How can I conclude this? And what he does is he uses both common sense as well as theory. First, he uses common sense. Why? Because he sees a category-bound activity, someone looking at, at bags of people unknown to him, or probably unknown to him, and standing really close to those people. That's weird. Second, he uses theory, and that he uses theory about passing. Passing as if you are one of them. So when the tourist went from, from one place to the other looking, he came along and just stood there with them until he saw Andrew Carlin, and then he quickly ran off. So using both common sense and theory, Carlin realized how you could recognize someone as a pickpocket. And I hope after this lecture, you try to look out in the streets and see whether you can see a pickpocket somewhere.